people. So we have people from Chicago, from uh, UK, and uh, maybe uh, Germany, and so on. So this is, I think, adds uh, to, uh, more interest to the, uh, and, uh, and uh, also industries the, the strength of the Italian science in this subject. So I, I, I'm very happy that this, uh, and I hope that uh, Gennaro will accept to do it next year as well, because this is becoming one of the core activities of this small academy. So I think that I will leave you, and I don't want to bother you anymore, but I, I, I think it's a duty to uh, thank Francesca Casadio, Gennaro Marino, who is the, you know, the man behind the, the thing, and Antonio Sgamellotti, who is a colleague from uh, Academia dei Rincei, and who is uh, going to chair this first section. So I don't bother you anymore, and I uh, give, my, uh, uh, I ask Antonio to coordinate the first section, and I try to listen to a few of your lectures, not all of them, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Due di far sedere il, lo speaker lì e poi quello o sta in piedi oppure sì, sì, mette le slide. We are, in we are in time. We are five minutes in advance. E se c'è person, I will be strict in respecting the time. Because you know we are in also in remote. And so is very well to respect the time. Five minutes before the end of your time, I will make you some kind of sign to say that you have still five minutes. I will not spend too much time in uh, presenting the speakers and the reason that they are so well known that it's not necessary. I want to say as much as time. Concerning the questions, I would say that they came be made at the end of the session. So, uh, in time, I would say with three minutes in advance, I give the microphone to Marika Spring, who is the an important person in the National Gallery, being the responsible of the scientific de department of National Gallery. That is, in my opinion, one of I would say my favorite galleries. Marika, to you. Thank you, Antonio, for those kind words of introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today at this meeting um, dedicated to um, my former colleagues, John Mills and Raymond White, um, both of whom spent their careers at the National Gallery. Um, they're known, of course, for their pioneering work in the 1960s and 1970s on the organic chemistry of museum objects. And um, Raymond still visits us every now and then and is just as interested in the GCMS as he ever was. So I'm going to range a bit more widely in my talk to set their work in, um, in the context of the history of research on the materials of paintings at the National Gallery, uh, not giving a comprehensive history but touching on some points. And also, given the topic of this meeting, picking out connections and collaborations over the years with research in Italy in the same discipline. I'm going to be drawing especially on the work of another former colleague, Joe Kirby, published firstly in this article in the Burlington Magazine, and secondly in another article about to be published in the proceedings of a seminar um, in 2021 organized by Utrecht University on the history of conservation science in the post-World War II period. And quite a few others um, of my past colleagues have also touched on this subject, especially in relation to conservation. So Susanna avery Quash, and I'll refer to some of her articles in our curatorial team, and also David Saunders, another former colleague. The first director of the National Gallery, Sir Charles Eastlake, was an artist by background, but was also remarkable because of his great interest in, um, in the um, conservation of the paintings under his care, and also on research into the materials and techniques. So this kind of research has really been embedded in the gallery's work right from the very beginning. And he was known mainly for his expertise in Italian painting, 
but the first volume of his book, Materials for a History of Oil Painting, published in 1847, was devoted to the history of oil painting in the Netherlands, and specifically the special characteristics of the medium used by the Van Eycks. And his methodology was a thorough review of the historic documentary sources that shed light on the technique and materials. And this topic was endorsed by the Fine Arts Commission in the UK, who in fact commissioned quite a number of studies in this period on historical painting technique. The aim of Eastlake's work was to try to understand why these paintings had survived in such good condition, with a view to promoting better oil painting practices in um, the British um, artists of that time, and I think this is sort of a legacy of, of Reynolds and his experiments. Eastlake knew Mary Philadelphia Merrifield, who's another important figure in this field of research at that time. And he mentions in his preface that the copies she had obtained of manuscripts in Italian libraries would be of great assistance to him in investigating the history of oil painting in Italy in his second volume, <coughs> which was published posthumously in 1869. Mary Merrifield had already published the first English translation of Cianino Cianini, and then in autumn 1845 was given government funding to go to Italy for six months, <coughs> again sponsored by the Fine Arts Commission, to collect historical source materials in the archives, specifically about oil painting in Italy. And this resulted in her two-volume <coughs> original treatises on the art of painting, published in 1849, which is still a valuable reference work today. And her volumes functioned as annotated editions of various collected treatises and, there <coughs> and were therefore a complementary counterpart to Eastlake's book, which instead used documentary sources to construct an overall narrative on the history of oil painting. And indeed, they referenced each other at many points. By the time Eastlake was writing, it was already known that oil was being used in Northern Europe as a painting medium, well before Vasari stated that Van Eyck had invented this technique. The case that Eastlake was making was instead that Van Eyck and his contemporaries <coughs> owed their pivotal place in the history of oil painting to some special improvements, especially modifications to the oil through the method of preparation. And he drew on a wide variety of historical documentary sources on painting materials for this work, an approach that is still very much part of the methodology of my department today. And many of these were only just coming to light from the archives and being published or translated into English for the first time as he was working on his book. And he himself seems to have been the first to refer to the Strasbourg and de Ketem manuscripts in relation to oils. He also studied the Arnolfini portrait closely with a magnifying glass to deduce what he could about the working properties of the paint <coughs> and, um, and then rationalized these observations with a detailed analysis of the recipes and instructions in the documentary sources for preparation of the oils. It's interesting to compare Eastlake's conclusions with what we know today from analyses with the techniques that we now have available to us. In the 1990s, Raymond White, working with Jenny Pills, analysed almost all of our early Netherlandish paintings for the scholarly catalogue, using first FTIR to determine the class of material, and then GCMS to identify the type of oil and also any pretreatment, as in the recipes that Eastlake was surveying, and also the addition of any resins, as Eastlake had suggested might have been done for glazes. And indeed, in general, both linseed and walnut toils were found, and they had sometimes been pre-perimalized or heat bodied. And it was also quite common to find a little pine resin had been added to red and green glazes. Eastlake devoted a lot of space in his book to the <coughs> many recipes for preparing or clarifying the oil. And he was the first to refer to the Strasbourg manuscript and considered this recipe to con to encompass the chief improvements which were introduced with the Flemish system of oil painting, as he said. He also concluded that the chief dryer which they used in preparing the oils or varnishes appears to have been white copperus, which is zinc sulfate, on the basis that it is included in recipes in both the Strasbourg and de Ketem manuscripts. 
Until recently, this conclusion was considered irrelevant to our modern investigations, but we then found, first through SCM EDX analysis, that Van Dyke did indeed add zinc sulfate to his paints, as we can see here in the EDX spectrum um, from a sample from um, the Arnolfini portrait. And then more recently, we have been able to map its presence um, with XRF, as in the zinc XRF map here. So there was truth in Eastlake's conclusions. And this also shows the importance of documentary source research to highlight materials we haven't yet discovered. Eastlake did reference the work of some scientists in his book, including some early experiments by the uh, Frenchman de Saussure on the drying and yellowing of oils. But his consultations with scientists on behalf of the National Gallery focused mainly on preventive conservation, including commissioning experiments from Michael Faraday, no less, on how to protect the paintings from the highly polluted air in Trafalgar Square. Faraday was also one of the authors of the 1853 report of the Parliamentary Select Committee set up in response to the cleaning controversy, where it was suggested that chemists be appointed to investigate cleaning mechanisms. Eastlake even suggested as early as 1845 that scientists could be useful for other research on the materials of paintings, especially those in the geological field, but it would actually be another 80 years before the first scientist was appointed. It was not until after the First World War that museums and galleries in the UK began to consider actually employing scientists. The British Museum Scientific Laboratory was set up in 1920 with Alexander Scott as its first head to deal with problems with their collection that had arisen from poor storage conditions during the war. <coughs> Harold Plenderleith was employed in 1924, and given the lack of scientists in other institutions, he was consulted by them on the care of paintings, and including by the National Gallery. He was involved in a meeting of scientists and curators organized by the National Gallery director in the late 1920s to advise on the problem of the flaking of paint on panel paintings, and subsequently published an article on the subject in the first volume of technical studies in the field of the fine arts, featuring the gallery's panel you see here by Verrocchio. The National Gallery was one of the places visited by William Burroughs from the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard when he travelled around Europe with his portable X-ray equipment, and he made X-rays of around 40 paintings, uh, 40 of our paintings in 1927, and these are the earliest X-rays we have of our paintings. The 1930 conference in Rome on the examination and conservation of works of art, organized by the Inter International Museums Office of the League of Nations, was a significant <laughs> stimulus for advancement of our field. And many museum laboratories were set up around this time, including that at the National Gallery, which was established in 1934 with the employment of the physicist Ian Rawlins as the first scientific advisor. And his work focused mainly on technical imaging, including X-radiography with the um, apparatus seen here in 1934, and also infrared photography, and this near-infrared detail of, um, of, the, of the hands of, of Arnolfini, um, probably made with the camera shown here, shows very well the changes made to the underdrawing. It seems that the curators quickly took up the opportunities offered by technical imaging, since already in 1937, Philip Pouncey, assistant keeper at the National Gallery from 1934 to 45, published an article where x-rays were used to good effect to argue for two artists, probably Costa and Mineri, having been involved in the production of the Palastrozzi. And this was on the basis of the very different style of the first version hidden beneath the surface, as in the Virgin's head um, seen here in, in the article. The description of the X-ray details was very thorough, but Pouncey didn't notice this small um, feature here, circled in red. And when we finally made an X-ray of the whole altarpiece in 2014, we realized that this was one of six cherub heads surrounding the Virgin, but subsequently painted out. 
During the Second World War, Ian Rawlins was taken up with organising the safe storage of the National Gallery collection outside <coughs> London, but during that period, many paintings were cleaned. Back in Trafalgar Square, an exhibition of cleaned pictures was organised in 1947, which was so popular it had to be extended. The small book explained the treatment and also included some notes about technique. At the same time, however, there were strong criticisms in the press about some of the treatments. The National Gallery therefore asked an independent committee chaired by Dr. Weaver of Trinity College in Oxford, Paul Coromans from Belgium and George Stout from the US to look into the matter. And this led to the Weaver report which did not find any evidence for damage, but was significant for the scientific department, since one of its recommendations was that a research chemist should be employed to conduct research into cleaning and improved varnishes. Anthony Werner was taken on in this role in 1948, and here you see the small chemistry laboratory that was set up. And Joyce Plesters joined in 1949 as work on the examination of paint cross-sections also developed, initially with the brass microscope shown in the slide, which Joe Kirby tells me is what Joyce used for the photos of the cross-sections in her seminal article published in 1956 in Studies in Conservation. And um, included here is a sample from Paul Iolo's St. Sebastian altarpiece, which we are re-examining at the moment. And I've... Um, uh, indicated it with the red square. And at this time, we find a card for each sample in our conservation dossiers with Joyce's description and a small black and white photo of the sample, which he then carefully tinted with watercolours. And here is also a new digital image of the same sample, which has lasted very well since it was made in 1953. At this time, the pigment identification was made with microchemical tests and heating or solvent tests were used for the binding medium. Venetian paintings were Joyce's great love and in the late 1960s, she collaborated with Lorenzo Lazzarini, helping to set up the laboratory of San Gregorio in Venice and then subsequently collaborating on the analysis of paintings by Tintoretto during the restoration of the church of the Madonna dell'Orto after the flood. And this was published in 1972 in the preprints of the Lisbon IIC Congress. And in fact, she examined 25 paintings by the artist over her career, including all of those in the National Gallery. But going back now to 1951, this was when two Nuffield scholars joined the scientific department for three years, one of whom was John Mills. And during that time, he did pioneering work on the, on the composition of Damar and mastic resins using paper chromatography, showing how it was possible to distinguish between them. And I've used a slide borrowed from Joe Kirby here, which summarises his main publications that came from this initial work. He returned to the gallery permanently in 1961, and soon afterwards, the funding was found to buy the gallery's first gas chromatography equipment, shown here. And the work John did with it on the fatty acid composition of dried oil paint films was again pioneering, and no one had done this before in any field. This allowed him to obtain results such as this on the panel from Museums Week in 1968, where the egg tempera medium used for Piero's baptism was distinguished from the oil medium used for Piero's St. Michael, and which could be specifically identified as walnut oil. The late 1970s saw another significant advancement, which was the purchase of the Kratos M MS-25 mass spectrometer, allowing John and Raymond White, who had joined the gallery um, in the later 60s, to carry out GCMS. And I'm not sure that this is actually the Kratos, but it is representative anyway, since Raymond's mallet is because all of the earlier equipment required a lot of attention. So, so we take the kind of analyses I showed earlier on Netherlandish painting somewhat for granted now, but this work by John and Raymond really laid the foundations for it. And it's worth bearing in mind when looking at any older results in the technical bulletins, that any published before about the mid-1980s would have come from GC analysis only, so they only report the type of oil. 
because before the GCMS was acquired, it wasn't possible to say whether the oil was heat-bodied or not. Going back again to pigment analysis, another photograph from Museums Week in 1968 shows the Milliprobe X-ray fluorescence analysis instrument lent to the National Gallery by Professor Teddy Hall from the Archaeometry Laboratory at Oxford, showing that non-invasive methods of pigment analysis were being explored even then. The instrument had a beam of only one millimetre or so, but in the end it lacked the necessary sensitivity and it was little used on paintings. By 1974, the department was able to carry out elemental analysis directly on cross-sections after acquiring a laser microspectral analyzer made by Carl Zeiss. And here, Joyce Plesters is working at the microscope that was part of the instrument. And the beam was only about 10 microns, allowing the cross-section to be analyzed layer by layer, a major advance on the previous microchemical tests. And this remained in use until SEM-EDX was acquired in the mid-1980s. And by this time, we also had X-ray powder diffraction um, bought in 1980, which was much used for identifying different types of lead to yellow, for example, and different forms of calcium sulfate in gesso grounds. All the research that was being produced with these new instruments was one motivation behind Gary Thompson's decision to launch the National Gallery Technical Bulletin, the first issue appearing in 1977. It perhaps also gave the freedom to publish in a truly multidisciplinary way. And even with this first volume, there are articles written by scientists, conservators and art historians in collaboration and our work is still rooted in this approach, where the application of science is not for its own sake, but firmly directly directed at understanding the National Gallery's collection. And we also still often combine the scientific analysis with the study of documentary sources, as Eastlake did so long ago. Of course, we've continued to update our equipment, but I'm going to end here rather than taking us up to the present day, as I promised in my title, as you'll get a flavour of that from the talk coming up very soon by my colleague, Marta Melchiore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marika. We are in advance. So if there are any questions, comments, they are welcome. <coughs> Otherwise, we pass to the next speaker. And next speaker is, I don't need to introduce saying anything, is Francesca Casadio, so well known, which will be reading some they are from Chicago. Francesca, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank you for, um, to the Academia for hosting us. And I'm going to move us on here. If I can see the cursor, great. Beautiful title. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, speak to you today and great to come, although a little humbling after Marika Spring and, and hearing about the detailed history of uh, uh, the scientific laboratory at the National Gallery, which I'll uh, touch upon just very briefly. Uh, my interest in studying the history really stems from uh, desire to understand this aspect of interdisciplinary collaboration between art historians, conservators, and scientific experts uh, in the advancement of our knowledge and preservation of uh, works of art. And certainly um, in, in this, I've been uh, intrigued by this uh, um, TED Talk where often we focus on what we're doing, and so the temptation is to 
uh, stay at the brush strokes. But really, when we can achieve this uh, uh, integration of knowledge and of knowledge spanning from the humanistic to the scientific, that, in my opinion, is where the breakthroughs really happen. Uh, so I, I'm going to start in the 20th century, and here you see uh, a view of the Art Institute, the institution where I work in Chicago uh, at its early, early foundings. And uh, in, in this, in my own understanding about the history of, of um, conservation science and what is now being termed uh, uh, by Sven Dupre, uh, um, Professor at Utrecht that Marika also mentioned, uh, the scientific conservation, uh, I've been, um, I found some of this uh, uh, papers that, and, and books that you see here very, very helpful. And I also am very grateful that Marika already has mentioned um, Merrifield and Plasters, and I want to uh, also draw your attention to the fact that uh, some attention now to also the female contributors to the beginnings of the discipline uh, are being uh, evoked. The other thing that to me was really interesting in studying the history was uh, uh, um, realizing that really there's been parallels and some specific peculiarities in the developments in Europe where really scientific, the scientists were called in in the Beaux-Arts school to aid artists in uh, making paintings that would last and that would have a beautiful technique. So studying the old, the techniques of the old masters to inform the artists of today. And so there is this combination of the scientific analysis with accurate reconstructions of and historical reconstructions of materials. There is a trend in the study of the historical manuals. Uh, and, and already uh, Marika has evoked the first uh, scientific labs in museums that were, were uh, established. And the 20s also are a time when a lot of this attention of scientific tools is directed to the um, identifications of fakes and forgeries. And uh, um, there was this interesting case on the Franz Hals where already you can see the beginning of the spitting of the eye of the connoisseur versus uh, the science, which would be a theme that, uh, <laughs> that recurs and, and that still is somehow unresolved in our practice of today, when, when it's a bad day, when it's a good day. Uh, it, it all works out really well. Uh, and, and some of this influence, some of the scientists from Europe came to the States uh, in the 1920s at the University of, um, of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, um, De Wilt was, uh, was uh, hired to um, study in the, the science of paintings. Uh, and uh, Marika also evoked uh, this really interesting uh, moment from the 1920s to the 1940s uh, together with the establishment of the League of Nations and that became UNESCO, uh, this uh, institute for um, the, the Insti International Institute of Intellectual Collaboration was established at the Palais Royal in, Royal in, in Paris and uh, part, and it was really for intellectual collaboration internationally of every type. Um, and uh, part of the interest of this group was also on whether there should be, um, there should be scientific expertise uh, focus on the study of works of art. And, uh, and you can see that in the, French, uh, in the French documents that are just recently being studied, some of the questions that we still ask ourselves today were already surfaced in terms of is it actually useful to, to um, apply scientific methods for the preservation of works of art? Uh, should there be an international organization organizing 
uh, organizing this type of knowledge? And uh, what would be the techniques that uh, would be more, most applicable? Um, and, and so as a result of this um, question in the, in the professional intellectual community, as well as uh, historical forces that have been um, studied recently more in depth by uh, Marco Cardinali, amongst other, in the 1930s, and it's been uh, mentioned before, uh, the International Museum Office of the League of Nations held a conference in Rome where um, a number of scientists and curators and, uh, and uh, prominent art historians and connoisseurs debated uh, whether um, scientific tools could in fact be of, of uh, um, interest and value to the field. And, and once again, I want to underline how in the header, for those of you who don't speak Italian, uh, there is mention of un gruppo di uomini celebri, and uh, how if we look around even in this, uh, in this hall today, uh, the gender uh, balance is definitely much better uh, nowadays, if you ask me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then as a result of this conference, which was held in Italy, but really had much more fruitful seeds uh, internationally, a flurry of establishment of various uh, museum uh, laboratories uh, happened. Uh, fortunately, Marika gave all the uh, specifics about the UK, uh, and then we'll, we'll move to the States uh, just in a little bit. Uh, but a number of important publications to really uh, solidify this uh, field of knowledge and of inquiry uh, were established. Among them, uh, the Technische Mitteilungen für Malerei in the 39s and the Technical Studies in the Field of Fine Arts at Harvard, and then, of course, very, very influential, um, the National Gallery Technical Bulletin. I will have to get some water. Oh, yes. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, I was supposed to offer <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no. I, I am not a very good chairperson. <laughs> um, it was certainly very influential for me as a young student of chemistry, where I almost read it as a magazine because, the National Gallery Technical Bulletin that is, because of this incredible ability of bridging the gap uh, with a language that was understandable both by the specialists but also uh, by curious readers. And as I'm studying uh, more about the origins of scientific labs in, in museums, I've also realized <coughs> that a lot of the history that we are focusing on is very centralized in North America and Europe. But more and more, um, it would be important to also look at the periphery. And uh, um, at a very interesting conference last month at the Prado, I also discovered that in the 1910s, uh, in uh, Mexico City, the Museum of Fine Arts in Mexico had a scientific lab. Um, there was a lab in um, Mumbai that was established also in the 30s. And even in Italy, there were a number of um, Gabinetti Scientifici in Naples, in the, in the Museo di Capodimonte, as well as in Milan. They were buying for predominance until the Istituto Centrale del Restauro was established. Um, and very interestingly, um, books were published about scientific examinations of work of art, and I was quite struck by this Renato Mancha, who um, proposed uh, really the, the, the Uber machine that had x-rays and UV and microscopes and raking light all in one room. Um, for the investigation of, of works of art. Of course, in the 30s, um, it's in the interwar period, is also a time when uh, European history is quite fraught. 
And so thanks to the work of Andreas Burmeister, who's, who was the head of the, of the Derner uh, uh, Institute in Munich, here is a photograph that he presented recently about the opening of the Dorner Institute, where sometimes the study of pigments and artist materials was also uh, promoted as understanding the true technique of the true artist with respect to the art of the degenerate artist. So sometimes there, there are also some darker shadows in uh, institutions that did really well, that did really good in terms of advancing our knowledge of of these materials. And, uh, and then in 1939, the Istituto Centrale del Restauro in Rome was also established at a time where, uh, of course, uh, the fascist regime was in, in uh, ruling in, in Italy. Uh, and, and these were really foundational labs that have continued to have quite uh, um, an influence in, in our field and also interesting to look at these historical images and see how our practices have changed uh, significantly in the study of works of art. Moving in this transatlantic, I will do uh, quite a bit of this uh, over to the States. The other thing that is interesting to realize is that while in Europe, initially the scientists are working in the Beaux-Arts Academy in the 19 in the 19th century up until those first museum labs. In the States, it's really with the 1928 establishment of the Fogg uh, lab at the Art, uh, Harvard Art Museums that scientific research in, uh, in museums and art uh, starts together with um, in association very much with the efforts of Burroughs, Alan Burroughs, who, as Marika mentioned, traveled really across the States and Europe to x-ray uh, works of art. And, um, and this was quite re re revelatory because truly, if you think about x-rays, it, it was a way for the scientists to give art historians new ways of seeing. For the first time, they could see uh, below the, the, the works of art. And this is correspondence of Burroughs to, um, to Forbes. And, and it's interesting because he says the practice in reading x-rays, which we have, puts us automatically in a position in advance of, other, of, other, of others. Uh, and, and so this, this identification that the ability to have scientific tools at their disposal gave them somehow a competitive edge is also interesting when we consider this bigger framework of the inevitable power dynamics between art historians and scientists that still working in institutions sometimes we experience. Um, so if we think about the 20th century, uh, if w one could, could make a summative assessment of, of the origins to a certain extent, um, what I can see is that in the States, more heritage science happened in museums, where in Europe it was a little bit uh, more, uh, at least at the start, in, in academia. In the UK, it's a hybrid, hybrid model because uh, quite a few labs were established at the time. And the focus of research is really on authentication, in the study of pigments, the cleaning controversies. And uh, those uh, sparing debates uh, about the eye versus chemistries uh, started at, at the same time. If we move to the 21st century, and here it sort of mirrors a little bit the history of my own uh, institution that was founded in 1893, and only in the 50s had its first conservator and had to wait until the 2000s to have um, a scientist. And certainly in the United States in the 21st century, the role of one foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, is quite uh, influential. Uh, and I put some numbers there. Over about 12 years, they gave approximately 50, 53 million to establish a number of scientific positions in laboratories and uh, postdoctoral fellowships and faculty positions. So of course, as we've seen, since the 20s, there were scientists in museums, but really we owe it to the Mellon Foundation to double pretty much the, the size of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, 
of this enterprise. And, and what I certainly have observed myself is that uh, certainly the 21st century saw an explosion of science in museums in the States, but um, academic research is uh, not very developed. Uh, while in Europe there's been a proliferation of really valuable uh, PhD programs and uh, the growth in terms of staff, scientific staff at museums has not um, mirrored what has happened in, in uh, the U.S., hence, hence the diaspora that uh, uh, certainly many Italian scientists have experienced. The other innovation has been in the mid search of teens of the 21st century, uh, the idea of diffuse hubs for science. And so mobile labs, uh, uh, and here you see the one at the Met and uh, the one at Northwestern University that I um, established. Uh, and of course, we took a page, this I gave uh, as, a, as a note to you, Antonio, um, from the Italian uh, MOLAB, but before then even, the French had the Labo bus, so of course, with time, uh, the size of the bus uh, becomes uh, smaller and smaller, and here was uh, a project that we did at the Musée Picasso in Antibes, where the MOLAB team was uh, very generous to come with their equipment. And this is again a, 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 a 1980s uh, slide from uh, from the French uh, investigation of the, of the paintings. And this was in 2011 when we were there with, uh, with Molab. And in the rest of the talk, I really want to focus on um, the kind of changes that we have seen in the field. And so one example is that now, while science was in behind the scenes, more and more we see uh, scientific research and conservation in view of the public. Certainly for me, the most uh, radical example of this is the depot in Rotterdam where this is actually a guided tour. Uh, the, the public is given lab coats and they can walk into the conservation studios, they can walk into storage, um, and uh, the entire collection is, is available. I'm waiting with much anticipation, and Lucia maybe will uh, will uh, tell us more ab about this about VNAs, where supposedly the public will be able to engage and handle the objects in storage. Um, and then there's been so much done, and again I've picked these examples because of our friends uh, here in the room today, to somehow normalize the science in museum, and in fact also disseminate it to the public here is the Operation Night Watch with the modern day uh, XRF analyzer in a, a glass box uh, where the public really can see uh, scientists at work at the museum. Uh, another um, very innovative project, although it got mixed reviews, uh, was creating a whole exhibition at the National Gallery that we visited uh, with, uh, with Marika in 2020. Uh, where basically the science was the piece de resistance of the whole exhibition. Uh, and, and this really has made this, this work much more in the public um, sphere. And I have just very quickly, I will go through a series of slides from the Art Institute, again, uh, mostly to honor some of my colleagues in the room, Federica Pozzi, who worked on this uh, exhibition at the Art Institute Renoir, but also for Van Gogh and all the way to, to Cezanne. And uh, what's interesting is really, I, I'm bringing these examples because, and, and the next one, this is an example of um, digital labels, so digital interactives in the galleries that explain the science of paintings uh, in, in very sort of simple terms with cross sections and some analysis. And I think that this, this is, um, useful because when you do an evaluation, which we have done, um, here you see an example of a, of a small intervention in the galleries where we had evaluators um, observe the visitors, and not only about 90% of the visitors take the time to scroll through all the information and read the information, but 98% um, went back and looked at the art. And considering that there are scientific papers that have measured 
that the average dwell time of a person in front of a work of art is 17 seconds. And if you have a digital label, they engage with the label for two or three minutes and then they go back. To some extent, with the technical analysis, we have definitely increased the engagement with the work significantly. Another thing that we have measured that was a surprise is that through explaining the uh, technical details of execution of a work of art, these are watercolors by John Singer Sargent. Then we also had qualitative interviews with the public, and this element of empathy uh, came out pretty strongly, and to me it was, it was really fascinating because um, our investigations into the process make the public relate with how hard it is sometimes to realize in the works uh, what, what you see more than just walking through the exhibition. The other significant impact that I'm seeing is in publishing. And so, do you all remember the appendix? or sometimes the science in the footnotes. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. It still sometimes happens. Uh, but certainly, with the 21st century, we've seen, and for us in Chicago, definitely in the digital catalog sphere, a much more uh, broad understanding of authorship and contributorship. Uh, and so here is an early digital catalog of our Impressionist collection and the scientists are all contributors. And then fast forward 2016, the scientists who actually did work on the Gauguin's are authors. And in monographic catalogs, then we also have multiple authors uh, for an essay that is now not at the back of the book, but actually in the middle of the book. So uh, that definitely has been uh, great progress. Uh, leading up to a really interesting experiment, if you're not familiar with it, I recommend that you take a look at this 10-year uh, uh, experiment that Peter Miller ran at, uh, at Bar Graduate Center, uh, really from the point of view of the historians and the art historians to look at uh, what he called cultures of conservation, and, and conservation is a human science, and, and uh, um, really realizing that despite this, uh, this closeness, closeness of practices were still very siloed. Um, and um, so really that started me thinking about the difference between a humanist authoritative voice and the more collaborative approach that we have in, in the sciences to, to authorship. And that to some extent, I've called it an activist view of, of collaborative uh, authorship. And I've also started to think about when is it that collaboration with art historians from a scientific perspective work, and when does it not work? And in my mind, and these are sort of some early graphs to, to pictorialize this, it's probably when the science has an impact in unraveling what happens what meets the eye, what, what happens at the surface of the work that, uh, that uh, we have the most impact. So if we look at brushstrokes to breakthroughs, uh, these are some of the trends that I am seeing in terms of what was front of mind in the 1920s and what today is really the evolution. And I'm gonna pick just, just a, uh, a few, I think this, uh, pitting of the eye versus chemistry, where now more and more there are multiple experts working under, under one, one roof. Uh, to some extent, from the wet chemical tests that Marika has, uh, has evoked to microinvasive and uh, non-invasive analysis, uh, and also from X-ray films now to computational imaging, hyperspectral data cubes, fusion of this data. Um, so I want to conclude just with a few notes that some of you who were at the Gordon Conference maybe uh, remember. I became curious to do a research about what are the publishing practices in object-based art history. And uh, this is, I collected about 80 responses and you can see quite well um, distributed between scientists, conservators, curators, uh, the gender balance reflects what is in the profession right now. 
uh, mostly U.S. and North America with some contributions and a good uh, spread between museums, government, and university. And uh, if you look at what are the factors that, that um, really favor collaboration, the idea of looking at objects together, something that is possible often in these museum labs, and uh, the flattening of hierarchies. <coughs> Nobody's doing research for somebody else. We're doing research with somebody else uh, are two of the main factors for um, success. Uh, certainly, you would not be surprised that the most important instrument development I are those that uh, create images, and the macro XRF is evoked uh, very often, although there are some times when you poll art historians, they also say there's no instrument that is really groundbreaking, it's really the art historical questions all that matter. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in terms of the type of publication that overwhelmingly is considered an, uh, uh, a successful example of, of uh, scholarship, the museum exhibition catalog really is evoked as one of those that uh, uh, is more successful in that, in that respect. Uh, and the National Gallery Technical Bulletin also evoked many <coughs> times. Uh, I'm taking advantage of the fact that Marika was, uh, was ahead of time because I see I'm reaching my 30 minutes. Um, so we can go a little quickly here, but certainly this idea of bridging the language gap is important because there's still some difficulty in understanding the language, the technical language that we use. Uh, I will not dwell too much on the tries, but I, I kept this because these are some of the quotes that I received in 2022, and we go back to the I versus chemistry, and uh, in Bernard Berenson's <coughs> foreword to Daniel Thompson, The Materials and Technique of Medieval Paintings, uh, you can see the quote, I regard all questions of technique as ancillary to the aesthetic experience, and uh, uh, Erwin Panofsky, a search of iconic um, <coughs> theories of, uh, of art history uh, pretty much also dismissed uh, any scientific inquiry as uh, uh, something that sure answers the question, but not really an art historical question. Um, when things work though, and the discipline I think is very, very uh, healthy because of this combination of museum science and uh, academic science, is uh, the ability to see in different ways, which happens all the time when you put together, um, when you put together um, experts from various, various disciplines. And, uh, and certainly there are many, many examples of these uh, uh, publications. What uh, I would argue for is if we can please stop ta calling it technical art history. It served a purpose at the time when the discipline was uh, established. I believe that in the 21st century, calling uh, this object studies or material si studies in visual culture would serve us better because if we make a niche of art history with technical art history, art history being already a discipline that is uh, struggling for its own existence. I don't think we serve uh, our, our field uh, too well. And I was really struck by this uh, uh, writings by Isabel Stengers um, that calls it an ecology of practices. And there's a really interesting quote there where uh, when she talks about uh, ecology of practice, she mentioned um, to feel the borders, that you have to approach the other discipline with questions that they will accept as relevant so that they don't go into a defense mode. And, and that was really, really interesting to think of this ecology of practice as a tool for thinking uh, and for th thinking across disciplinary boundaries. Um, so I, I, in all this uh, various ways that we have called our field interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, I owe it to Anna Holling who teaches at UCL now, uh, this concept of post-discipline. So in looking at the history of scientific labs and museums, I am wishing for a post-disciplinary world where it doesn't matter if you're a scientist or an art historian, uh, we're really all looking at works of art with passion and with our expertise and advancing knowledge of how they are made, what they mean, and how we can preserve it for the future. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Francesca. You touched, in my opinion, three important items. The evolution of the collaboration among scientists, curators, and restorers. The new approach of scientists towards visitors in museum, and also the language innovations. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Now we pass to the third contribution of this first part of the morning. It's a contribution from remote. We go to London and I ask Marta Melchiorre di Crescenzo of the National Gallery to take the microphone and to speak to us. Thank you, Professor Sgamelotti, and good morning, everyone, from a rather rainy London. Uh, I'm going to try and share the screen that we tried before, and it was working, and I think it is still working. Uh, so I'm thanks a lot to the organizer of the conference and it is really a pleasure to be here and have the chance to talk about some of the work that i do as a senior scientist at the national gallery uh, but before diving into the world of old master paintings i've been asked to spend a couple of words on the training i received um, in italy highlighting aspects of it that help me to excel in uh, this area well I'm one of the very first students who graduated at bachelor and master level in conservation science at Ca' Foscari University in Venice. And despite some hiccups that were inevitable for a program that was that new back then, I think that the program for which I need to thank the memory of Professor Biscontin uh, included the right balance of hard core scientific topics, art history and conservation studio practice, which was indeed an excellent way um, to interact with real objects, learn how to assess their condition, take samples, test materials and methods for conservation, which are all important skills for a conservation scientist. Although probably not enough to excel in this field at an, interna at an international level. Still at Foscari, I then completed a PhD on conservation issues of contemporary murals, a research line that around 2008 and 9 when I started was um, still new for the group working with Professor Zendri and that until then had, um, she had mainly focused on topics related to stone and built heritage. And I think it is the experience I got during my PhD shaping my own research, hands-on analytical equipment, working with a variety of Italian partners, proactively setting up new collaborations at international level that in my case was with the UPUVE in Spain. So all of these made me a resilient researcher, able to work on different types of collections at international level, as I did not only at the gallery, but also at the British Museum and historic royal palaces. But thinking uh, of my current role, uh, which requires an excellent knowledge of painting materials and techniques to properly contextualize the result of scientific research, I should probably also thank the extra time that I invested carrying out internships in painting conservation studios, plus my particular interest in what I'm going to call now technical art history, although Francesca Casadio don't likes it. Um, and uh, I nurtured this passion I had working with uh, Professor Teresa Perusini, which was the supervisor of my bachelor and master thesis, and which led to a postdoctoral fellowship on polychrome wooden sculptures, during which I certainly strengthened my skills into the analysis of paint samples which is still a uh, part of my job here at the gallery, together with the use of spectroscopic imaging techniques, uh, reflectance imaging spectroscopy in particular, for which I've become the main point of reference at the gallery. And during my seven years now within this amazing organization, I contributed to numerous projects, either to inform conservation activities to feeding to curatorial research for exhibition and cataloging programs. And I was so lucky that uh, 
one of the very first paintings I investigated with reflectance imaging spectroscopy was Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks. And it had been so extraordinary being able to contribute to the discovery of more figures belonging to the first composition that Leonardo had initially drawn on the panel and then abandoned in favor of the well-known painting. And it would be very tempting to talk about this today, but since the research has been thoroughly presented and published, I decided to uh, talk about more recent work, which showcases the integration of spectroscopic imaging techniques and analysis of samples into the investigation of paintings. My first case study is the portrait of uh, Charles William Lambton, popularly known as the Red Boy, painted by Lawrence. This is one of the most loved images of British art and the first painting ever to be included on a British postage stamp. It perfectly exemplifies how scientific analysis was critical in supporting decisions taken during the conservation treatment. Preliminary cleaning tests had indeed shown that some of the red passages of the boy's suit were sensitive to solvents. And indeed, the combined investigation of cross sections and surface scrapings highlighted the presence of medium rich surface glazes, likely to include the, the same natural resins uh, found in the non original varnish layers. And another reason why I'm showing this quite spectacular, I would say, um, cross sections is that uh, they revealed the presence of an extremely thin, even yellow layer underneath the red paint with SEM EDX and Raman analysis indicating this contains chrome yellow in the form of lead uh, chromate sulfate. And in 1825, when the portrait was ex executed, chrome yellow was uh, still a relatively new pigment, although not completely unknown to other British artists active around that time, such as Turner and Constables. And Lawrence uh, was keen to use new painting materials, but uh, equally concerned about their stability. So he had a collaboration with the British chemist and pigment manufacturer, George Field, who tested pigments for him. And there are some notes in Field's journal books dated around 1815, which record that he had tested samples received from Lawrence which um, turned out to uh, be uh, chrome yellow. And if this was not interesting enough, XRF scanning revealed the presence of chromium under large expanses of the boy's clothes, confirming that the thin yellow layer seen in the cross sections was not accidental, but some yellow paint initially used by Lawrence for the boy's suit, which is extremely relevant because um, historical accounts suggest that Lawrence had originally painted the boy in yellow. So we were able to prove this. Now, um, traveling both in space and time, uh, I'm going to present some very recent works, um, work carried out on these wonderful 15th century Cassoni panels depicting the story of David by the Florentine artist Francesco Pesellino. These um, were treated recently in preparation of a forthcoming free exhibition dedicated to this artist who was celebrated in, in his lifetime, but is now often overlooked. And in this case, the complementary use of XRF scanning and reflectance imaging spectroscopy made it possible not only to identify and map most of Pesellino's painting materials non-invasively, but also to fully appreciate his remarkable skills of painter of ceremonial splendor and exquisite detail. And I'm proud to say that some of the images I'm presenting today will feature in a video as part of the exhibition. This is one of the uh, risk maps showing the distribution of azurite as identified from this spectrum from the sky. And the map was gathered from the signature features of the pigment seen in the shortwave infrared. And it shows the use of azurite not only in the sky, but also in the hills, in the farm landscapes, the rivers, and apparently some tiny, tiny dots in um, the foreground area. 
And if we look closely at one of these areas, we see how Pesellino used in the touches of Azurite in the central part of sunflowers. A lovely detail, but so easy to miss when looking at the full scale painting. And here I'm quickly showing the copper XRF map where this detail is completely lost among the many copper rich passages depicting the grass and leaves. And uh, Pesellino remarkable skills are also evident in his lavish and very precise use of gold and silver leaf here relighted by the respective XRF elemental maps. And again, if we look closer, we see that the silver leaf is not only used in the um, knight's armors, but also in details such as the bridal mouthpieces and the horseshoes. And hopefully you also appreciate how small some of these pieces are. And equally small are the gold leaf pieces in the dress of this young girl. And we should remember that the standard practice for an artist uh, of that time would have been to apply a relatively large piece of gold leaf on red ball and then paint the dress on top of it, leaving out the decorative pattern. Here instead, Pesellino applies small individual pieces of gold, one for each feather on red ball. And I particularly like the uh, false color reflectance image on the right because it works in a complementary way to the XRF map, not only showing the gold leaf pieces, but also in very bright yellow, their edges where they have been covered by paint to define the final feather shaped decorations. And now going back to the silver leaf, uh, so you must, you might have already noticed that this was um, rather abraded and tarnished. So technical images such as the full scroll of reflectance image here in the center were particularly useful to highlight um, and visualize fine dark paint lines that Pesellino used to depict the armor details and also a dark paint used for the armor shadows, so to give um, the metal a three-dimensional effect. And interestingly, this uh, dark infrared absorbing paint was also found to contain low levels of copper. Much higher levels of copper were seen in other paint applications, which also look dark on the painting surface, but do not absorb in the infrared images and were seemingly used with a different function to embellish the metal leaf. And we can appreciate this here in a detail from the brocade dress of one of the ladies, where it is just possible to recognize a few pigment particles, which su suggest that the paint was originally green and has altered with time. So these observations prompted the second phase of the investigation aimed at clarifying the composition of the copper containing paint applications through analysis of paint samples. And today I'm presenting only some initial results of this um, that is proving to be a very challenging uh, investigation. So here is a cross section from the same dress of the lady we were just looking at. And you can see it is almost impossible to distinguish and therefore even to, to identify the particles of the copper based pigment uh, that has been included in the paint. This seems to have highly interacted with the paint binding medium, resulting in the overall darkened appearance of the paint. I'm not sure we will ever be able to say what pigment was originally included in these decorative paint passages, but um, it might be relevant to point out that the green copper mineral pigment identified in the paint for the trees consists of rounded particles of malachite with some angular copper sulfate, some silicon potassium feldspar, and um, a couple of particles of azurite. So I'm mentioning this not only because it could be um, interesting to establish the geological source and provenance of the pigment, but also uh, perhaps to explain its reactivity with the binding medium when applied over gold leaf, if of course this was the green pigment used there. And a couple of highly deteriorated copper rich particles were also seen in a sample from one of the paint applications looking dark in both the visible and infrared images and seen to register less strongly in the copper XRF map. And this paint primarily consists of carbon black confirming the hypothesis that it was always meant to be dark 
and therefore had a modeling function rather than a decorative one. And once again, it was not possible to properly identify the copper based compound added as a minor component to the paint. And to date, it is not clear whether it was used to slightly shift the color of the paint or maybe to act as a secative, uh, with this latter option pointing out um, uh, the potential selective use of an oil binding medium for this paint application of a metal leaf um, in a work that otherwise is painted in um, egg tempera. And with these slightly open questions, I would like to thank the various colleagues that contributed to the material I presented in the slides, and in particular to other Italian scientists who have been working with me, Eugenia Guedes da Filicaia, who is currently uh, completing a PhD in partnership between Bristol University and the National Gallery, and who has been doing a maternity cover oh. with us. And she had been carrying out the FTIR and organic analysis of the Pesellino samples, and also Silvia Rita Mato from the Courtauld, who helped us with Raman analysis of the Lawrence. And um, before, thank you all for your attention, I wanted to finish, if possible, with um, a small observation about what is going on in Italy. I mean, we know that the academic level at the Italian level is amazing. We all train there. But this is indeed what I found yesterday looking at the website of Ca' Foscari University. So this suggests that scientists owning a master's degree in conservation science, and also to some extent uh, those owning a degree at bachelor level, have access to a number of jobs. And this is something um, that I would like to discuss potentially in the round, round table at the end of the conference, uh, because certainly it was not an option when I and my peers graduated, nor even when I completed my PhD now about 11 years ago. So I'm really glad this has become an option, and I hope that my scientists who graduated uh, during these years and will continue to graduate could actually find suitable jobs in the field outside academy and without leaving their country. So, and I thank you again for your uh, attention. Th thank you, Marta, for your speech and also for your very interesting comment that I will uh, comment later on at the end of the section this morning. Thank you very much. There is any, we have some time, so I mean, if there is, oh, Marco. Thank you, Marta, for your talk. This is Marco Leona, and I'll actually be uh, chairing I'm the I'm sorry, but I cannot hear, so. I think there is a problem can with the you, microphone. Can you hear now, me now? Now it's fine, yes, um, yes, I can. Thank you for your talk. This is Marco Leona. I will be chairing the session, the, the round table, so I will certainly um, remark on your comments and, and make that a point for discussion. Um, I wanted to ask you a question on the Cassone, though. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the details in uh, silver leaf uh, with the painted decoration on top um, always beg the question of how the, uh, the commitment, the patrons, and the, the, the people who looked at that object, which uh, was uh, supposed to be durable, uh, perceived the silver leaf, which would have, I imagine, tarnished quite uh, quite soon. And so is there any evidence, anything in your studies or in, in uh, archival uh, textual material that, that talks about that? I, I encountered the problem, for instance, in Japanese art, where often the moon uh, or the crest of waves are completely black. And what I know from that field and the, the critique there is that People didn't care. It happened very soon, and they made peace with that, which would have, of course, created an image uh, completely unlike uh, the real world. So just, just a thought for you, and uh, if you know anything about that. So that is a very interesting uh, remark. So what I can say is that we see the use of these uh, dark paint with a modeling function to give the, um, the metal leaf a three-dimensional effect. So I think that although the tarnishing would have happened quite soon, um, there was 
an idea that there was need of defining a three-dimensional shape. I'm not sure how much they were aware of how everything would have worked together um, as soon as the silver leaves would tarnish. But this is something that I, yeah, would be very interesting to, to look into. Um, things that we noticed is that there are a lot of decorative patterns, uh, mainly on the gold leaf, uh, but also sometimes on the silver leaf, uh, those are certainly present. And as far as the gold leaf, some of the patterns were used indeed to catch the light in a specific way. So to create, again, um, specific optical effect when the object was illuminated, less so on the silver leaf. So maybe there was um, uh, already um, a... Um, awareness that the metal would have soon change is uh, reflecting properties. Thank you, Marta. I think that now we can conclude the first session of the morning and we deserve a break.